Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for following us online today. Uh, today is our great pleasure and honor to invite Dr. Carl uh, uh, Frey from uh, Oxford University, who is also the author, uh, the technology chap, uh, one of the best sellers in both uh, online and also in the bookstore. And uh, I think the traditional Chinese version is also already released. Of course, uh, as we uh, briefly uh, discussed with Carl, uh, it's also great to hear that the simplified Chinese, the Mandarin version is going to be released very soon. So I think today is really uh, important to have discussion on the topic, uh, given as we know that automation or artificial intelligence is happening and also changing our life uh, so rapidly, uh, not only in the last um, five to 10 years, but as uh, Dr. Kao mentioned, uh, addressing in his book, uh, that could be checked back uh, to the industrial revolution or even earlier, a uh, couple uh, hundred years ago. So I think uh, today, uh, as we briefly uh, discussed before uh, the session getting started, uh, I think that is very important for those of the business school students following us online today, given um, maybe we know that artificial intelligence now is like replacing a lot of jobs. Uh, for example, Deloitte, uh, KPNG, and also EY, a lot of auditors, uh, their job now uh, probably will be changing in the foreseeable future. Uh, given like the introduction of the new technology. So I think uh, today is really good uh, to have Carl with, uh, with us today. So really appreciate for your very well time. So Carl, if you are ready, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's really great to be with you and having the opportunity to share with you some of the work that I've been doing over the past couple of years on technological change and how it's impacting growth and, and labor markets um, and the distribution of income more broadly. Um, I should say that the book that I'm going to present to you today is a bit of a Western biased account. Um, and one reason for that is that frontier economies, paths to development tend to be different than um, latecomers paths to development. Uh, if you're at the technological frontier, you're forced to innovate into the unknown, and, and there are many uh, disruptive and unintended causes, uh, fr uh, consequences from that that tend to be often particular uh, to um, frontier um, economies. So what I do in the book is that I'm basically tracing what's happening at the frontiers of technological change from the first industrial revolution, which took off in Britain and um, around 1750. And, and from sort of the second industrial revolution where America took over technological leadership. And I'm basically tracing what's happening in the United States from that point onwards. Um, if I'm going to write the sequel at some point, I may have to add China, you're catching up very rapidly and probably as some uh, instances in of artificial intelligence um, already um, at the technological frontier. But anyhow, this is mainly sort of an economic history of technological change, but also drawing some lessons uh, for today. And there are a couple of key points um, I'm, I'm trying to make in the book which I think uh, are important for understanding the um, revolution in artificial intelligence um, that seems to be around the corner. Um, and I'm not sure exactly how the debate is um, unfolding in China, and I look forward also to learning from you on this, but here in the UK, it's very much a polarized debate. So on the one hand, you have uh, people mostly technologists who think that this time is really different from other episodes of technological change. There is likely to be mass unemployment because of recent advances in artificial intelligence. And on the other hand, you have mostly economists who have been saying that, well, we have seen mechanization accelerating now for uh, almost two centuries and we have more jobs 
now than we had um, two centuries ago, or at least labor force participation rates are higher. And you know, if this, uh, if history is any guidance, we should be uh, feel uh, feel quite confident uh, about the future because accelerating automation only brings um, greater prosperity. Um, and the point I'm trying to make in the book is that actually, if you look um, at the history of technological change, there have been very different episodes. Uh, and part of the reason for that is that there are also different type of technologies. And you know, all technologies can't be uh, created equal. Um, and um, I think one important distinction to make in particular is between enabling and replacing technologies. So some technologies create new tasks and new jobs um, for labor, and thus increases the demand for labor and people's wages. On the other hand, there are replacing automation technologies, which tend to replace um, working people in existing jobs and tasks. So if you think, for example, you know, at the, of an automatic elevator, it replaced essentially uh, the operator. And even though we're building more and more skyscrapers and have more and more elevators, uh, it's not creating new jobs for ele uh, elevator um, operators uh, because that task has been automated away. Um, and um, perhaps not uh, too surprisingly, if we look at history, what we see is that when uh, technology is taking more or predominantly the replacing type, uh, we've seen more uh, social um, unrest. And often we see that the losers from these episodes of replacing technological change have also tried to various means uh, block the introductions of these technologies which they feared threatened uh, their jobs uh, and skills. And the ability to do so really is very much dependent on the distribution of political power in society. Craft guilds, for example, um, in pre-industrial time, uh, did endorse many technologies, but not those that threatened their jobs and skills, and they quite forcefully resisted them uh, throughout also the Industrial Revolution. And it was only when the political clout diminished that the Industrial Revolution in Britain um, could really take off. Um, and I think that sort of brings us to the key point, which is that, you know, even if uh, the uh, long run consequences of industrialization uh, were enormously beneficial, if people are concerned about short term disruption in labor markets and are able to block the introduction of these technologies, people will be denied the long term benefits. Um, from them. So a key point of the book is to say that we really need to think about the short run um, uh, as well and try to make the transition as smooth as possible and um, not to be denied this long run benefits of artificial intelligence, which I will suggest is in many ways primarily um, a replacing uh, technology. Now, I start off the book to illustrate this by one um, example, which uh, goes back uh, about a century. So around um, uh, 1900 in most cities in Europe and the US, you had lamp lighters that walked the street with tor uh, uh, torches and ladders to uh, ignite gas lamps every evening and uh, to keep cities uh, bright at night. Uh, and nobody would argue that it was a bad uh, invention, right? It may sort of the switch to electricity was a bad invention. It, you know, um, made um, pollution levels uh, lower in factories and in cities, and it made cities brighter. Uh, but it did cause some uh, disruption for particularly this group in the labor market. Um, and, you know, fearing uh, el el um, electric streetlight and um, its potential to displace uh, lamplighters' jobs. Lamplighters in Brussels took the street uh, in fear over its disruptive effects. Uh, the entire situation 
soon escalated. Police were sent out to squash the riots. Uh, they then raided police headquarters and the army was sent out to resolve the situation. Now, from a very long run perspective, uh, these lamp lights just may seem backward and Luddite because if we take a very long view of economic history, economic growth was, short, uh, was um, slow and stagnant for uh, most of human history. It only really took off around 1750 with the first industrial revolution, which allowed us to mechanize more tasks, which in turn allowed us to produce more, pe allowed people to uh, earn higher incomes. And it also made it possible for us to really mass produce a lot of goods and services that benefited uh, consumers that were unconceivable uh, a century ago. We would not be speaking about mass producing a vaccine uh, for this pandemic if it wasn't for mechanization and industrialization. Um, and in uh, addition to that, if anything, you know, mechanization made over the long run uh, working life more convenient and comfortable. Most people in the industrial West have shifted from farms and factories into um, uh, white collar jobs, which are often done in air conditioned offices. And, and even if you think about the same occupation, like the occupation of a farm labor, where modern technologies like tractors have been adopted, farmers don't uh, have to struggle with bad weather conditions and swarms of insects and so on. You know, a person in a modern farm can sit in his or her tractor and listen to the music of his or her choice. So working conditions have improved uh, tremendously as well over the long run as a result of technological change. And that is the reason uh, why we think of the first industrial revolution as something uh, that was worth uh, while uh, having. Now, many believe that this sort of coming revolution in artificial intelligence could bring, uh, you know, similar um, prosperity. Um, but I think it's, you know, in the light of many of the concerns around its labor market effects, I think it's instructive to actually go back and revisit the episode of the first industrial revolution, which put us on these sort of trajectories of what uh, Kuznets would call uh, modern growth. And I think it's fair to say that people during the Industrial Revolution had very different views of it. So Benjamin Disraeli, before he became Prime Minister of Britain, wrote a novel called Callingsby, in which one character remarks, um, I see cities people with machines. Certainly Manchester would, must be the most wonderful place of modern times. The very same year that Callingsby was published, Frederick Engels published his Conditions of the Working Class in England. Uh, and uh, the book was actually written during his stay in precisely Manchester. Um, and Engels, needless to say, had a very different take uh, on what was happening to um, Britain as a consequence of mechanization. He argued that mechanization, first of all, or something unnatural because it puts people in the sort of rapid, repetitive motions um, of um, machinery and mechanization. And, and he argued that mechanization would only serve to drive down people's uh, wages uh, to subsistence um, levels. And, and I think it's important to remember that while we know that you know, there was no iron law of wages and Engels was by no means alone in thinking so, wages began to rise steadily um, uh, around uh, the mid um, 18th century. Uh, but before then, even as the British economy took off, wages were stagnant and probably even falling at the lower end of the income distribution. Um, so um, even during the period of industrial takeoff, the benefits from that didn't really trickle down to uh, the working population. And a number of measures, if you look at consumption, if you look at biological indicators of well-being, such as heights, suggest that people were actually worse off 
during the first sort of classical period of the Industrial Revolution. And it sort of raises the puzzle. Why would people voluntarily have agreed to participate in the industrialization process if it reduced their utility? Well, the simple answer is that they did not. They petitioned to parliament on several occasions to block the introduction of new machinery, which they feared threatened their skills. Uh, they rioted against the mechanized factory on several occasions. And how did the British government respond? Well, it actually frequently, or on several occasions at least, responded by sending out the army. And, and the army that was sent out against the Luddites, who went out and smashed machinery, was actually larger than the army that Wellington took against Napoleon in the Peninsula War um, of 1808. Um, and, and I think it's important to remember that this period of revolutionary technologies, as the historian Eric Hobsbawm has put it, also bred a lot of political revolutionaries um, along the way. Uh, the Communist Manifesto, for example, was a direct response to uh, the industrialization uh, process, um, and perhaps not quite surprisingly so, because of people, a lot of people lost out as domestic industry, you know, artisans working home with the children um, and family, and at their own pace, not necessarily at the pace of the um, factory clock, all of a sudden were challenged by vast mechanized factories who could produce those goods much more cheaply and also often employing child labor, uh, which was much cheaper. So we saw a lot of these middle-income artisan jobs disappearing, new jobs being created in factories, yes, but often you know, taking advantage of the fact that you can use child labor because these um, tasks were very much simplified in the factory setting. Now, the point of my book is not, you know, to argue that we are likely to live through the same period all over again. I mean, every episode of technological and social change has been different, but there are some parallels and some differences, and I would like to point those uh, out. I think one of the key um, similarities is sort of patterns of um, inequality, uh, because if you look at sort of really long run trends in income inequality is measured by the Gini coefficient in frontier economies like the UK and, and the US. What you see is that inequality went up significantly during the first industrial revolution as more people then gradually began to shift in into better paying uh, factory jobs over the course of the 20th century, inequality declined. And it's now been going up again um, since the 1980s and levels of inequality are now approaching levels we haven't seen here since uh, the first industrial revolution. Now, I should say that, you know, uh, uh, technology is not the only thing that has been driving patterns of inequality in the UK and the United States, and I'm very clear uh, that in the book, but I think it's a key driver if you want to understand what's happened to the 99% rather than the top 1% uh, technology is one of the prime uh, factors. Um, and, you know, these differences in the first industrial revolution being an episode of replacing technological change as we just see, so it mirrors what we're seeing now with an, uh, the computer revolution being um, an increasingly um, um, labor replacing episode of technological change um, as well. And um, now some we may point out that, well, you see this trend since the 1980s, uh, but computerization is something that has been going on for much longer. And that is certainly true. I think the first electronic computer was developed at the University of Pennsylvania in 1947, uh, but it consisted of 18,000 vacuum tubes, weighed several tons, it were probably, you know, not be able to fit it into uh, one of your uh, lecture halls. And, and as a consequence, it had virtually no impact at all uh, on uh, either labor market or productivity growth. It really took the microprocessor and the personal computer to begin to have uh, sort of an impact on the labor market. 
Um, and what computerization did is essentially two things. On the one hand, it uh, allowed companies to coordinate production at distance and take advantage of cheap labor in countries like China and elsewhere and offshore some of the production. But it also allowed businesses increasingly to automate away routine repetitive tasks, um, mostly sort of the type of tasks that were done in factories. And again, on this picture, you can see the consequences of this beginning in the 1980s. So wage growth tracks productivity growth well, quite well over the course of the uh, uh, 20th century in America. But from the 1980s, you see this decoupling between wage um, and productivity growth, which is what you would expect if a, a technology increasingly takes a replacing form. And in addition to that, if you look at what's been happening um, on wa for, uh, uh, with wages for different skill groups, you see that you know, wages basically increase in the United States at all levels for all groups um, up until the 1970s. Then you have the oil price shock, wages stagnate for everyone for a while. But then again, beginning in the 1980s, you see here that there is quite a significant divergence, particularly among men and uh, relatively skilled and unskilled men. So you see that uh, men with no more than a high school degree who would have taken on relatively low skill jobs in factories before automation and uh, robotization uh, uh, driven by computers um, took off, their wages have actually been falling by roughly 30% uh, since the 1980s. So it's ju not just sort of um, um, that income inequality has been increasing, we see certain groups in the labor market which have arguably been uh, made worse off, at least in terms of earnings capacity um, in absolute terms. Now, before this pandemic, if you look at um, the United States, um, you see that the labor market on average was doing pretty well. Uh, but averages conceal a great deal of variation. Uh, and if you look across uh, cities in the United States, you see that robot adoption um, uh, differs significantly across American states and cities. So most robots in the US are located in uh, the Rust Belt. And so Michigan alone, for example, has more robots than the entire uh, American West. And if you look and zoom in on some of these cities in places like Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, what you find is that you have very persistent um, levels of non-employment. Um, um, and with those high levels of non-employment, um, you also have a lot of social problems. So you have increases in crime in places when new jobs disappear. You have declining marriage rates in those places. You have deteriorating public services. And you have what Angus Deaton and Anna Case have also called the deaths of despair and rising levels of suicide and substance abuse and, and so on. And well, much of the politics in the United States surrounding the sort of decline of the white working class, if you like, has focused on globalization and trade. Um, uh, is that Chinese import competition has actually mostly affected um, American labor markets south of the Rust Belt. Um, so, so automation is a distinct pattern from Chinese import competition. And if you want to understand, you know, why um, President Donald Trump managed to win Michigan, Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, which had been, you know, won by the Democratic presidential candidate every election since 1992, it has much more to do, I argue in my book, with automation than in import competition, because in the Rust Belt, that's the places where you've seen um, the force of automation being much more significant. Now, you know, 
we have already seen um, you know a wave of offshoring the rise of china has already happened you can't you know do the same thing twice uh, and most people in um, um, the united states in the industrial west now work in non traded sectors of the economy so they're relatively shielded from future globalization uh, but they're not as shielded from automation you can think about autonomous trucks you're not going to offshore the job of a truck driver to China or somewhere else, but you can potentially automate it. The same goes with cashiers and, and many other uh, occupations. So I think, you know, the attention to this, um, the challenges um, of economic polarization in the United States are likely to drift more uh, towards automation. And of course, this is just looking at what has happened in the past as artificial intelligence um, becomes a more pervasive technology, it's also going to have more impact um, on the labor market. And it used to be the case that, you know, machines only had a comparative advantage in routine rule-based repetitive activities that can easily be specified in computer code and therefore um, be readily automated. But what we see with machine learning or artificial intelligence is that we don't necessarily need a computer programmer to specify what the technology should do at every given contingency, right? Mach with machine learning, uh, the technologies can infer the rules of the game themselves through trial and error and tapping into sort of the data trails we leave behind. And this is, you know, what's driving a lot of um, the advances that we see in you know, machine translation, natural language processing, uh, autonomous vehicles, medical diagnostics, and a lot of things. Um, and it's certainly fair to say that, you know, I used Google Translate yesterday, it's far from perfect. Uh, you know, I don't know what, uh, what, what uh, uh, the benchmark is with that Chinese algorithm, so I presume they are also not yet quite perfect. And, um, the reason for that is simply that, you know, every revolution in new technology starts with imperfect technology. The early steam engines that sort of, you know, came to power the first industrial revolution, they were just merely in the very beginning used to drain coal mines. And even that, they didn't do particularly well. It took James Watt and the sort of invention of the separate condenser to make steam engines energy efficient and in a similar fashion, we will need some innovation to make artificial intelligence, I think, more data efficient. Now it sort of learns from millions and millions of trials. Uh, small children, on, in contrast, can learn from very few trials. So I think we will need some more innovation in this space to make algorithms more data efficient. That innovation is going to uh, you know, accumulate over the next years and decades. And as that happens, the potential scope of automation um, is going um, to expand. Uh, that being said, uh, I think there are still a number of domains in which human workers still hold the comparative advantage, where artificial intelligence is still very far uh, from human level capabilities. Uh, one of those um, uh, domains is complex social interactions. And I think the state of the art here is probably best described by Turing test competitions, where chatbots try to convince human judges of them being a person. So by the end of the conversation, a judge has to decide have they been chatting with a chatbot or actually with a person. And some people argue there was a breakthrough here a number of years ago when one chatbot managed to convince 30% of human judges of it being a person. Uh, but it did so by pretending to be a 13-year-old Russian orphan boy with no understanding of English culture and speaking English as a second language, right? And this is just, you know, basic text communication. If you think about in-person type of interactions, we're very far uh, from automating those type of tasks. And the same, I argue in this paper written with Michael Osborne, who's a professor in machine learning here at Oxford, is true for creativity, 
and complex perception and manipulation tasks. And we can go into that later in the Q&A session um, if you want to. But I do think at the same time, while these bottlenecks still persist, um, you know, people tend to underestimate the scope, potential scope of automation. And the reason for that is that most things are not automated by exactly sort of replicating what a human worker or person is doing, right? We didn't automate away the jobs of lamplighters by building robots that carried torches and ladders and could climb lamp posts. We did that by, you know, um, switching to electric, uh, electric street lights and regulating the lamps from stop stations. So we sort of restructured the work in order to automate it. The same is true for, let's say, laundry work, right? So a century or so ago, uh, there were a lot of laundresses with essentially washed by hand, right? So they had to you know, walk out uh, of the house to sort of chop down trees and carry woods, wood and water into the house and then heat it on the stove and then sort of do hand washing, right? We didn't automate a way of that work by replicating those procedures. We invented the electric washing machine, which does the same thing, but in a very different way. So by restructuring environments and simplifying tasks, a lot of things can be automated. And what we find in one paper, which came out back in 2013, is that a fairly large share of jobs, whether it's in retail, whether it's in transportation logistics, whether it's in construction, whether it's in um, uh, white collar work, um, can be automated as a consequence of that. We estimated sort of roughly 47% of jobs in the United States are automatable from a sort of mere technological capabilities point of view. Obviously, you know, a lot of other factors drive the decision to automate, but that tells you something at least about the sort of technological capabilities. Um, and when we published this paper, we also published a sort of fairly detailed list of 700, uh, 702 occupations and their relative exposure to automation. And you can imagine that some people went through this list in some detail uh, and made fun of some of the findings. So one thing, thing that we found, for example, is that fashion models are exposed to uh, automation. Uh, so my friend Ken Kukier at Economist, he used to tease us uh, for this and found that to be completely absurd. Uh, so it's been fun to point out to him now that um, the fashion models that you see on this picture here, they actually don't exist. They've been created uh, by what's called generative adversarial networks from thousands of uh, pictures. And they have their own Instagram accounts and they're already being used by companies uh, like uh, Dior. That being said, I think one of the key findings of uh, this paper is actually not to do with sort of the share of jobs that are um, potentially exposed to automation, but the fact that it's primarily low skill, low income jobs that are exposed to automation. So it's not the doctors and lawyers um, that are going to find the jobs um, uh, at risk. Yes, there are certain tasks uh, in the legal profession that can be automated, but the job is far from uh, fully automatable. So it's the type of jobs like people in call centers, cashiers, tr uh, truck drivers, and so on, they are uh, primarily exposed to uh, these changes. At the same time, and I think this is important to uh, point out, computerization automation has historically also created new jobs uh, and tasks. But those tasks have been very different from the ones that have been uh, replaced. And they tend also to emerge at different locations um, from where old manufacturing jobs um, have uh, disappeared. And you can see this by tracing new job titles decade by decade. So back in the 1970s, for example, you don't find any new job titles that are related to computers. From the 1980s onwards, you find that most or a lot of new job titles are particularly related to these technologies. But these are much more skilled jobs. And they tend to cluster in relatively skilled cities um, where they benefit from a, you know, new firms uh, being created um, close to other uh, companies where they benefit from knowledge 
spillovers. And at the same time, you know, in old manufacturing cities, where new jobs, where old jobs have been automated away, we don't see many of these um, new jobs emerging. So it's very much also a geographical uh, mismatch um, that is happening. Now, um, I'm going to sort of basically stop here, but I would just want to leave you with one thought, uh, uh, which I think that um, the economist Leontief put quite nicely uh, uh, some decades ago, which is that if forces could have joined the Democratic Party and voted, what happened on the farms might have turned out differently. They might have used their political voice to bring the spread of the tractor to a halt. Um, and the key point here is basically that even if we see these new jobs emerging and people are unable to um, shift into them, you know, resistance to mechanization may still be um, a rational response. Um, and one survey, recent survey in the United States actually the majority of Americans now favor policies that will limit the number of machines that can be used uh, to replace labor beyond non-hazardous tasks. And we've been seeing a number of episodes in the harbor of Los Angeles, for example, you see some workers going on strike over the fear of the introduction of autonomous cargo trucks. Um, and these uh, people, well, they have some outside options, but it's not switching into software engineering. And often the outside options require a college degree or um, you know, um, often don't pay as much as these many of these sort of um, middle income jobs. So I think that is important to keep in mind. It's important to think about how you can smoothen um, these transitions. Um, I do look into some policy proposals in the book, and I'm very happy to discuss them during the Q&A session. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kao, to really give us uh, a comprehensive landscape in terms of automation. And I think it's really impressive, uh, given that uh, a lot of the case uh, and also a lot of example that you pick up is just so vivid. For example, that uh, it's just 100 years ago uh, that the light still lighted by someone uh, every night and also uh, extinguished by some uh, somebody else uh, every uh, morning uh, before like the, the morning come in. And it's also very impressive that uh, the, the newspaper uh, that you, you show in the last few slides that shows the whole this edge. So um, for example, nowadays we talk about the cashless society uh, but maybe not too much people have that awareness. But if we look back hun just 100 years ago, the whole list edge was uh, discussed widely on the newspaper, and that's very impressive. And the second one, I think today, uh, that the webinar, your presentation is also quite fit with our webinar series. The reason is just a couple of days ago, uh, we had a discussion with uh, Professor David Christian, the author of Origin uh, Story, uh, which we talk uh, the story from the Big Bang uh, to today. So I think it's really great uh, to see what's happening in the last uh, few, few decades and a few hundred years ago in terms of automation. So uh, before we turn to uh, the discussion, uh, because of the request from the Princeton University of uh, Press. Uh, let me also share uh, the screen. Uh, if for those of like uh, the, the audience following us online, so you uh, feel that the topic uh, fit your interest. Here is like the QR code for buying the book uh, that publishing by the Princeton University Press and also the topic we are discussing today. Okay, so uh, thank you very much once again, uh, Dr. Kao. And I think with that, I would very much like to uh, invite uh, two of my colleagues, uh, both Li Nan and Jia Jin, uh, to join the discussion. So first of all, uh, Li Nan, uh, would you like to uh, share some of your feedback 
and also your yeah. insight or any question for um, Dr. Kao. Okay, thank you, Hong Yi. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Feilat, uh, for your perfect insightful sharing. Uh, I think it's for me, it's my first time to thinking that um, any uh, bottleneck of the uh, technology of automation, uh, especially at the personal level, it has so such close relationship is with the uh, personal employment. But uh, as my research is more at the company or the firm level, uh, as uh, uh, when I visit some companies, especially some small and medium-sized companies, uh, they also very really struggling in uh, how to make such decision. As you know, if they introduce uh, such automation production, uh, it means that definitely, literally, it means the long-term benefits, but it also means a short-term huge investment for them. So they are very struggling uh, to decide how to balance it as they are, their size is not large. So for them, uh, such kind of investment uh, means a lot for them. Uh, I just wondering whether you have any suggestions for uh, such kind of small and medium sized companies, uh, how could they um, balance such kind of long-term benefit and short-term investment, especially for the automation. And uh, I'm not sure whether it's some uh, uh, effective model for them uh, to solve such kind of uh, situation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, that's a very good question. So I think it probably depends on in which business and in which industry uh, you are. And if you're in a very mature industry where you don't expect to have a, a lot of- Most of uh, them, I think, is a manufacturer, ma manufacturing, yeah. Man manufacturing, yeah. So obviously manufacturing is still much more capital intensive than services. And I think mm -hmm. one of the things with artificial intelligence is also capital intensive because they have to build up data pipelines and your high skilled workers and um, so on. So it's not without uh, investment, but obviously manufacturing, um, it's uh, more investment. I think um, there are two components to this. So yes, over the long run, you can cut labor costs and obviously wages have been increasing in China um, and are uh, likely, I would suspect, to continue to do so. And secondly, if you want to tap into global value chains, I think you know only machines can produce exactly the same quality over and over and over again. So to tap into global value chains, I think is also a quality question, which is hard to get around without mechanizing. So I think if you want to get into global value chains, um, and export globally, I think automation is um, probably necessary in, 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 in many industries. But obviously, you know, if you're a small factory and you're producing mainly locally and you have a consumer base uh, locally that uh, is loyal to you, um, you know, you can uh, produce for that as well. I mean, one very interesting to see thing to see in the UK, in Germany and elsewhere is that, you know, craftsmanship is on the rise again. So you have a lot of, you know, small businesses setting up, producing uh, various things locally and um, not necessarily looking to expand into global markets, uh, but still, you know, um, uh, doing quite well. So I think it's hard to give you sort of very generalized answer uh, to your question. I think it very much uh, depends on uh, the, the, the type of business model you have. Okay, thank you. Okay, so how about Jia Jun? Uh, as we know that you also do uh, some research on like the urban annihilation and also uh, the city. So I think it will be really great to get your insight and the perspective or any feedback for Kao. Thank you so much, Hong Yi, for having me. And thank you, Dr. Frey, for such insightful comments and such excellent summarize about the key points in your book, especially in terms of like how to explain the social and economic consequences in the long term. 
um, and how we're gonna get used to such inevitable automation, the, the world full of automation from the historic perspective. And, and also like I'm personally quite impressed that in your book, you clearly illustrate the distinction between the labor enabling and the labor replacing technologies, how these two kinds of technologies could be either beneficial or harmful to the entire population, to our as human beings. And the, the worst case is that, you know, eventually, or in the, in the near future, 40% of our employee could be replaced. But on the bright side, you mentioned that, you know, some other high tech jobs or like high skilled workers could be benefited from this AI technology, this industrial revolutions, because for example, you know, the, the, the most classic case is like biometrics where this new technology uh, could enable more natural interactions between humans and machines. And also it could also create many other relevant capital incentive jobs, like high tech jobs for the top, you know, software engineers, they could work I mean, I would say like AI scientists would be pretty happy about the, the fast adaption of AI technology, right? They're, they're pretty uh, obsessed with the new technologies, uh, how it's going to be applied to us uh, to, to, you know, to make our daily life more conven convenient. And, but on the other side, I mean, personally, I'm optimistic about AI technology, but on the other side of the world, I mean, some big figures, especially for the big figures in the uh, high tech world, like the, um, some owners of some giant conglomerates, they are really concerned about the adoption of AI technology, like Bill Gates, Elon Musk, they have already issued a very strong warnings about the inherent danger of such powerful technology. And they have inspired many people that, you know, uh, it could put, put us in some dangerous place, like you know, a, a quote by Elon Musk, like he says, he said maybe in uh, a couple of years ago that this tech cutting edge technology, AI technology could even be far more dangerous than nukes. And it could eventually those like, you know, autonomous or self-aware robots could eventually, you know, replace us. Like, you know, as a regular person, I'm not expert on AI technology, but when speaking of AI technology, I, I guess like as most people, I would think about like the those like scenarios in, in the sci-fi movies that you know those robots could be super intelligent and they could be weaponized and harm us and eventually replace us in the in a violent but not a peaceful way. So I I'm just curious that which position are you in? And are you also concerned about the danger of the, this evolution in AI tech and Whose opinion do you think is more credible? Thank you. Thank you for that uh, that um, very uh, good question. Um, so Nick Bostrom here at Oxford University is a colleague of mine, and he's written one of these books, which has been cited by Elon Musk and others um, about superintelligence and the concern that you know we will develop some super intelligent machine that will be by accident uh, turn us all into paper clips because that's the wrong sort of value function. Um, and you know I think that in the very very long run, if you don't think that we're more than a, a composition of atoms, then you should be able uh, maybe at some point to you know reach human level. Um, capabilities and uh, potentially beyond. But I don't think we have any clear sort of conception of the path of how to get there. So just to give you one example, like in 1850s, you know, Samuel Colt did all he could to make parts completely interchangeable. So you didn't, didn't need hand fitters um, to make the parts interchangeable. So you, you, you could um, cut um, out those labor costs. It took 50 years from cult to sort of the Ford factories. We actually managed to produce interchangeable parts. And this is, you know, a relatively straightforward engineering problem uh, that took a long time. Now, you may say we have better technological capabilities now and, you know, we can you know, solve these problems a lot more easily. And, and I think it's true for many engineering problems. 
But the path to general artificial intelligence is not a general engineering problem because nobody has any conception whatsoever about how we could potentially get there. I mean, some seem to think that it's just about more data and uh, you know more slow and all of that. But you know, there's nothing to really suggest that uh, that is true. We may very well have, and I think most AI researchers here at our engineering science department and computer science department um, at least think that a lot more innovation is going to be needed. And we don't know what that innovation is going to be. So we need a lot more exploration, and you know, it's going to be very unpredictable. So in my view, we're very far off something like, uh, you know, super intelligence. Um, you know, is it going to happen? Maybe in 100 or 200 years. I have no way of knowing and nobody else has any way of knowing. Uh, but, you know, we, we, we should clearly, you know, think about issues related to AI ethics and, you know, uh, I think it makes sense, as Nick Bostrom has, to think about the potential consequences of that um, uh, to, um, to sort of alleviate some, some of the concerns. But I don't think it can be our baseline scenario. I think it's, you know, uh, over the next couple of decades, a very, very uh, low uh, probability event for the reasons I mentioned. I'm so glad to have you agree with me about the answer. I mean, I, at least we don't have to worry too much about the current generation. Uh, then, especially for, for the next century, uh, for, for the next hundred years, and, and even if most jobs will be killed, but we create mo most jobs like, um, so, so that's why, especially you mentioned that they are scientists. I mean, they are pretty happy about this, you know, um, new revolution about the technology especially the AI technology, so th those like popular areas will be, will continue for the next decades. Yeah. Thank okay. you for, for, thank you for the answer. So thank you both uh, Li Han and uh, Jia Jun. So here are my feedback, I would like the question for Kao. The first one is when I read your book, I think it's very impressive that you pick up the example, the Robotnik in Italian, uh, which, uh, uh, eventually become like the world robot in modern world. And the Robotnik is also the meaning uh, kind of slave in uh, uh, maybe four or 500 years ago. So I think at that time, uh, maybe hot human uh, being in general, for most people, uh, they don't have too much uh, um, liver. And uh, because of the uh, disease and uh, like the huge demand of labor increase and have the liberalization. Wondering, uh, given the increasing trend for automation uh, nowadays and in the foreseeable future, how do you see that the most uh, uh, human being uh, looks like? Or we be like the slab mostly such like uh, four or 500 years ago, or maybe uh, that will give us more uh, liberty. So what do you think about that? That is the first one. And the second one is also very interesting that you pick up the example uh, for the people in uh, North Africa that use camel in ancient time for their transportation. Uh, but the lead technique uh, for using camel seems not really lead land to the uh, correct direction because eventually they can use camel, so they don't really care about building the proper road because camel can uh, anyway work in a very difficult road, that's fine for them. So do you see any technology will lead us into the wrong direction? Uh, do you envisage on that? So thank you very much. Those are two very good questions. And I can add to the camel that, you know, in, eight, in 1900, electric cars were roughly on par with gasoline-powered cars. Um, and a number of, you know, oil discoveries and other small inventions sort of tilted the balance in favor of gasoline-powered cars. 100 years later, you know, trying to get back into electric cars, uh, again, over environmental concerns. So, yes, you can get in this sort of path-dependent uh, tra uh, wrong trajectories. And I think there is a risk that we could do that with artificial intelligence 
um, as well. And the reasons I, I say this is so if you think about back in 2013 when we published this uh, paper, you know, artificial intelligence was a very diverse field and it still is in many ways. But what's happened since then is that it's been a narrowing down, particularly on one approach to artificial intelligence, which is deep learning. And deep learning is by far the most data uh, intensive um, approach to artificial intelligence. And, and it's mainly been driven by you know, large tech companies uh, like Google, Facebook. Um, um, I don't know exactly what it looks like in China, but I think uh, large tech companies in uh, China are sort of increasingly focusing on uh, deep learning as well. Um, and um, I think, you know, the notion that you can solve many of these problems with huge data sets and just, you know, um, more significant computer resources, and I think is wrong and leading in uh, the wrong direction. And, you know, some people say that data is the new oil. Well, if data is the new oil, then it might well be, you know, a resource curse <laughs> because uh, potentially, you know, we need what I discussed earlier, this separate condensing moment to make artificial intelligence more data efficient. And the more, you know, we're focusing on data incentive approaches to um, artificial intelligence that could potentially um, lead in the wrong direction. So I'm advocating, for example, for science policy to fund more, you know, alternative approaches to artificial intelligence, like symbolic uh, AI, for example, which is much more underfunded in our invasion approaches and so on, to counteract this sort of premature narrowing down um, on deep learning, because artificial intelligence is still in an experimental phase, and it seems very premature to settle um, on one way forward um, already. So uh, it's a very good question, and that is um, definitely one um, of my concerns. Uh, I've been speaking for so long now, so I've forgotten the, about the first part of the question. So you were asking two questions, I think. Right, right. So uh, the first question, uh, so the second question is about the camel, and uh, the first question is about that you mentioned the uh, robotnik in Italian is meaning slave in ancient time. So I'm just very interested uh, to get your perspective. How will that look like if the automation is still keep accelerating? And uh, will we, uh, most of the general, uh, almost of the people will become slaves again, or we will lose our liberty, or is much more increasing liberty? What's your perspective on that? So I don't think our liberty is going to be determined so much by technology. It's going to be determined more by, you know, political institutions and, um, you know, um, other social factors. Um, but what I would say is that, you know, um, the beautiful thing about automation or, you know, going back to my slide on uh, comparative advantage, you know, creativity, complex social interactions, these are the things that, you know, where domains in which machines and algorithms still perform poorly, and these are also the things that most humans enjoy uh, the most. And so I think, you know, for most people, you know, it's more liberating in the sense that for me as an academic, for example, I don't have to do all the stats by hand. You know, it frees up time for me to think more creatively about, you know, new research questions and interesting things to pursue. But I'm also in a sort of privileged uh, situation. So for other people that, you know, haven't uh, had uh, the benefits of, you know, going to college and um, so on, um, op job opportunities are more limited. Um, so I think that is a challenge, but the technology itself allows us more to focus on, you know, things that we actually enjoy. And I would argue that that is to some extent given that we have, you know, the institutions to make the gains, you know, um, widely shared, that is more liberating than uh, anything else. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carl. So I think with that, uh, I would very much like to turn to uh, the selective question from our audience. So here we got uh, 22 questions uh, from the Princeton University Press. Uh, their, uh, their readers, they uh, submit a 22 question for you. 
but due to time constraint, we will only select a few questions and to get it on board. So let me share my screen. Okay, so uh, could you see my screen uh, with the QR code and also the question in the left hand side? Uh, uh, can you see my sharing screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great, great. So uh, maybe Li Nan, I would like to get your assistance. I will quickly scroll uh, my screen and uh, it's the question from the audience. And uh, when you say stop, I will stop it and uh, that will be the question we bring to the, the session, okay? Okay, my pleasure. <laughs> Okay, so uh, let me start. And when you say stop, I will stop there. Okay. Stop. Okay, this one. Okay, this is really a long one. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let me see. Hmm. So the question is like that. Uh, so we are talking about automation and also uh, the, the political uh, and also relevant stakeholder. So the question is that uh, given uh, the automation, as you mentioned, Google, Amazon, those of the tech giant. So the question is, uh, what's your perception on that? Do you think that the government will collaborate with those tech giant? Uh, to to like uh, work for automation, or they will like uh, a kind of against of those tech giant and uh, to protect uh, all the benefit of citizen. So I didn't catch the last part of the question. The uh, the line broke down a bit. Right. So what do you think the position of the government will they? Uh, because given automation mostly is conducted by the tech giant. So obviously, um, what do you think that will uh, mainly adopt the uh, business model of automation or uh, do they uh, take any measure to protect the citizen? Uh, what do you think about the government's tendency? Citizen oh, very or good. tech giant? It's a very good question. I mean, I can only note that, you know, different places have took, taken very slightly different approaches. So I think in Europe, for example, GDPR and, you know, other regulatory measures have been more restrictive towards the tech giants than they've been, for example, um, in the United States. And um, I think before, the US election, there were definitely you no know, concern in the tech community that there will be antitrust and other measures taken against those companies. I think as a consequence of the election, those prospects have been very much uh, diminished. So in the near term, you know, I think that not much is um, likely to change. Um, overall, um, you know, Europe seems to be a bit more uh, concerned about the relative power of these tech giants and the potential uh, labor market effects um, of artificial um, uh, intelligence. You know, things like the robot tax were very narrowly voted down in European Parliament a couple of years ago. It's still something that's on people's mind, um, to give you one example. Right, right. Thank you very much for that. Because I think even in your book, you addressing and mentioning uh, some of the machine actually was developed or uh, invented uh, maybe a long time ago. But because of the political um, uh, maybe power or like the craft deal, they don't really like them and uh, have um, uh, some people against them. So I think it's really good uh, to get your perspective on that. So with that, uh, maybe let's move to the next question. So Jajin, would you like to help me to stop? And I will stop uh, that question and uh, that will be our next question for Carl. 
Absolutely, it's an honor. You may start. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay, stop. Okay. Okay, so uh, let me see. Oh, this one's much shorter. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> so, Jiajun, would you like to translate for that? Uh, can, can you highlight it? I mean... Yes, the... you just pick up the, the, the important point. Oh, this one, I see. Right. So, is there any policy... Oh, one second. So th this question, Carl, this question is related to the, uh, the national policy. Uh, one, you know, there are so many people out of a job, out of labor market. Do you think it, it is a great, great idea for the government to give the, the unemployed people uh, the cash, make huge amount of like payment transfers to, to the people out of the job market? Do you think it is consistent or sustainable or good policy? Or do you have any ideas you can share with people re relevant sure. to this national policy? Yeah. So there's been a lot of debate, at least in the UK and in Europe, around uh, universal basic income. I'm not sure if that's a debate that has uh, featured in China as well. But a lot of people think that because of you know, these advances in artificial intelligence, we need to provide you know, some um, uh, safety net for people that struggle to adjust and UBI is the solution uh, to that problem. Uh, my problem with UBI is I don't understand why it should be universal. So if you replace, for example, in Europe, existing welfare transfers with a universal basic income, you will worsen income inequality because you're going to transfer um, you know, welfare payments which have been made to those at the bottom end of the income distribution to people at the middle and the higher end of the income distribution as well. I'm much more in favor of something like, you know, Milton Friedman's negative income tax, which essentially provides a floor, your income can't fall below that, and you still have incentives to work and top up your income. Uh, and, you know, we already have, you know, safety nets to varying degree. In Sweden, where I'm from, we have a sort of relatively generous uh, safety net. In the US, obviously, you know, it's very different. It's, you know, uh, um, things like your health insurance is tied to having a job and things like that. So there's a lot of variation uh, also uh, between um, countries. That being said, though, I think, you know, a lot of people var value work in itself. So it's not just about compensating uh, people. I think many economists see sort of the purpose of, produc um, uh, the purpose of production um, being consumption. But I think, you know, production has some purpose in itself. Uh, people who work tends to be happier uh, than people who don't. So it's not just about compensating people, it's also about you know, policy to, to create new jobs. True. From the perspective of social planner, it's always a tough job to guarantee the social equity, especially given people the equal access to, to the development of the technology. That's, yeah. that's something we should consider. Yeah. Okay, so, so maybe uh, uh, if uh, Carl, your schedule still allow, maybe uh, let's have one more question. Will that be okay for you? One more is fine, yeah. Okay, so maybe here we uh, have some balance. Uh, one question from uh, the foreign uh, reader, foreign audience. So this is the question from uh, Pao Yijianvi Nano. Uh, the expansion of what can be automated has raised a number of concerns in the past many years. So uh, do you think that the expansion could affect income equality in the future? Also, whether its impact could be different in developed and the developing economy? Right. So, yeah, I think, I mean, as I mentioned in my presentation, I do think that, you know, automation um, or is going to be um, exacerbated by artificial intelligence and that has the potential uh, to widen uh, income inequalities. W will the impact be different in developing uh, developed and developing countries? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, a lot of, you know, automation uh, 
is not going to happen in some developing countries because those jobs have not been developed to automate in the first place. So if you look at a lot of uh, African economies, for example, uh, their problem has been that they haven't, you know, really generated a manufacturing sector. So industrial automation is, you know, not a key concern there to the same extent. I think their concern is more that, yeah, it's making it harder potentially to develop and, you know, clear, create new jobs in manufacturing industry. So it's a sort of, um, if you like, a different set of concerns. And I think, you know, that is true for artificial intelligence and, you know, some low skilled services that are likely to be affected uh, by this as well. It makes it less likely that those jobs will migrate, let's say, you know, call centers migrating from the US to African economies if those jobs can be um, automated. So maybe sort of it makes uh, uh, it harder to catch up, if you like. Okay. So thank you. Thank you very much, Carl, once again. I think today, um, when I read your book, uh, maybe a couple months ago, I really feel like uh, because now they have a lot of book talking about automation, uh, but it's a lot of details. But uh, when I read your book, it helped me just like climb the mountain and uh, go to the top of the mountain to the, see the beauty of automation. And today, when we have the chance to talk to, with you, it made me feel like I climbed to another top of mountain to see the picture uh, in a comprehensive way. So really appreciate for joining us uh, in this lovely morning in your time. And uh, also really appreciate for those of you following us, particularly uh, let the Princeton University Press, your reader contribute uh, those questions. So really appreciate for Carl once again, and also Li Nan and the Jia Jun for your valuable time today. Thank you very much for having me. It's been Thank an absolute treat and a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Thank Happy you. Thanksgiving, by the way. Take care. Take care. Look after yourselves. Okay. Stay in touch. Yeah. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.